kind of the last topic to to get to, and we've already sort of touched on it, was like some of the side effects of maybe perhaps some of this androgen, you know, therapy or hormone replacement therapy, hair loss. Mm -hmm. And this is something I know you've personally talked about. It's it's very interesting. And I'm I sort of just want to talk about it out of my mm -hmm. own my own interests. Like why why does hair loss occur? Like what is the role of DHT in that process, you know? It's kind of a crazy thing how in this day and age, we have like advanced AI stuff. We have like all these like cutting edge treatments for, you can like literally completely get rid of the likelihood of ASCVD through crushing ApoB and like different things of this nature. But like hair loss, no one has a fucking clue what happens or how to prevent it without just crushing your DHT levels essentially, which is wild that that's still a thing. But as long as I've been researching this stuff, there's been people that are like, oh, the, you know, the solution's on the horizon. Like every two weeks, you'll see some viral article on Twitter. It's like so UCLA scientists found like Rodin regrew all his hair after shaved from like random thing. Like, oh my God, D-ribose is the solution. I'm going to go dump it on my head. You should see the nutty shit that people on like Reddit and whatnot dump on their Melatonin, heads. Melatonin, right? Yeah, I think sulforaphane was one too at one point. Oh yeah, Broccoli sprouts mm -hmm. on the head. Didn't end up working though. And then there's some adjunct stuff. Like once you attenuate the miniaturization potential through the androgen related activity in the scalp, that's where you can then look to, you can have a bit of a top up like ketoconazole shampoo, for example, is like a mild anti-androgen too, that could add some additive protection on top of, let's just say you're on finasteride instead of the more nuclear dutasteride. And you felt like that risk profile was superior, for example. Ketoconazole does help. There's studies showing it's equivalent to the hair growth results of 2% minoxidil via a totally different mechanism, which is like very significant for something that's like an over-the-counter shampoo that also you can get that attenuated dandruff to some extent. Seboric dermatitis um, can improve the scalp environment to your, your scalp environment to some extent, depending on, I don't know if you're prone to like, I don't know, fungal overgrowth, for example. But in general, it's like a mild 5-alpha reductase inhibitor and topical antiandrogen that's just like a good shampoo that doesn't require like the risk profile of a finasteride or dutasteride. But it's like typically for most people not going to be sufficient to offset it unless you're like mildly, very lightly prone. That's where you need to mm -hmm. like layer up with the 5-alpha reductase inhibition pharmaceutically. And then minoxidil is the growth stimulant that is FDA approved and works reliably. It's just hit or miss if it works based on your own enzymatic conversion capacity. So it needs to convert into minoxidil sulfate in the scalp to actually work. And if you have inadequate sulfotransferase enzyme activity, it will not, you could be a total non-responder even though you're using the full drug dose every day. Those individuals either have a issue with the scalp environment, like they're not getting it into where it needs because with topicals, some of the problem often is just like your scalp either is unhealthy the environment or it's not clean enough or like you're not using a high enough dose of the drug. It all depends on the person and the formulation that you're using. But in general, if you're using it properly and at a high enough dose, you'll be limited by this enzymatic pathway. And there are ways to upregulate it. One is compounding the minoxidil with tretinoin, which can upregulate the sulfotransferase enzyme and allow more of that conversion to take place. And then there's microneedling, which also seems to be pretty dramatic turning some non-responders into like significant responders or magnifying the results like multiple fold for people who were responding just not as well as they could be either driven through lack of adequate absorption and or lack of adequate sulfotransferase enzyme activity that also seems to be upregulated via this like manual like micro damage essentially like there's some crazy studies with individuals who've like burned their scalps that had balding and then they ended up like regrowing hair after which is pretty weird wow. via like the recruitment of growth factors that like you wouldn't have gotten if it wasn't for that like dramatic event. Now, obviously no one's going to light their head on fire, hopefully, but that's a thing. <laughs> um, so with respect to the the topical, you know, strategies like the minoxidil, I mean, obviously what, what are the side effects of that? Is that? So it's like a very terrible blood pressure drug. So it was originally prescribed for uh, high blood pressure as a Wait, lonitin. Oral? Yeah. Oh, I thought it was topical. Yeah. So what they found when they prescribed it for blood pressure decades ago was that one of the side effects besides like people like fainting when they're standing up or having low blood pressure or water retention was hair growth everywhere, including their scalp significantly. 
So they're like, huh, maybe we can take this drug and repurpose it for a topical for hair growth because it's like essentially a, a really bad blood pressure drug with a black box warning on it. And they did successfully. And now it's known to be like the growth stimulant for your hair and seems to avoid a lot of that systemic side effect profile that comes with the oral formulation. Some people still use the oral formulation. Dermatologists have uh, seemingly adopted it, I would say a little bit haphazardly without really accepting the risk profile accordingly, because it's like a pretty, it is a bit of a sketchy primitive drug, orally especially, because the liver has so much sulfotransferase, uh, enzyme conversion, enzyme activity that leads to the minoxidil sulfate conversion that you get systemically. It leads to some people like pericardial effu uh, effusion, like water retention, dysregulation of uh, uh, electrolyte balance, like it's a potassium channel opener, that's how it works. And systemically, it has a much more significant side effect profile than topically. And it's not uncommon to see people even microdosing it, getting arrhythmias and like talking about like chest pains, like freaking out and going to the hospital. And it, it's a lot of people just get chucked on it at like low dose, but it's still low enough. It's still high enough that it causes like these problems in some people. Works really well though, but topically it's like the most benign, at least entry level way where you can not, you can get over the counter, like you can just buy it off of Amazon or at Costco or whatever. Um, way more uh, likely that you won't undergo side effects using it topically. And there are some studies, many studies that show like similar benefit profiles. It's just like a bit more of a nuisance because it's topical and you have to adhere to the protocol. But like, you know, black box warning drug from like, you know, pre 2000 for blood pressure versus like the topical reiteration that is like likely not to cause that. Worst case scenario, you can elevate the uh, efficacy profile by trying the tretinoin with it, trying the, the microneedling with it. And if it doesn't work, like maybe at that point, look at the, the oral if you want. But like, that's kind of like the escalation in risk. Um, is the tretinoin oral or? Top, topical. topical you would get okay. like a compounding pharmacy oh, to okay. formulate it with a minoxidil because you can't buy that over the counter that would be like you would now have gone to the pharmaceutical route at that point because you would typically what i would do like if it were me is like i'd start with the minoxidil topically if no response i would probably look at micro needling to ensure there's actual absorption occurring and or the enzyme activity that can be manipulated via that manual, because it's not an extra drug that I'm adding. It's just like manual, like micro damage, essentially, that I do once a week. And newest literature reveals that you might be able to get away with only doing a 0 0.6 millimeter depth, as opposed to the old studies had everyone doing 1.5, which was like guaranteed to draw blood. Like I have some of my old YouTube videos where like I have like a bloody scalp in the video because of like, the depth that it would I would be going to to be you know using this uh, the devices, so zero point six seems to be potentially uh, as efficacious with less of a cosmetic issue, quicker recovery, etc. And it's not it's not more drugs. It's something that like I recover from quick in my scalp. Seemingly, you know, is there some potential downstream issues to hitting my scalp with that once a week? I don't know, but like so far so good from a lot of the data that I've seen. And like for me using it. And then from there, I would escalate to like the pharmaceutical compounded route at that point if you needed to with like the tretinoin compounded minoxidil. Um, it's funny, the microneedling, like I'm interested in it for skin effects. And so... Yeah, people use it on their face too, like all well, the time. Yeah, so I, you know, it is something I'm going to do. Um, and when I went to my dermatologist and saw like some of the brochures with their studies, like because my dermatologist does actual research... Mm. And it was funny in their brochure, it was like, there was like this whole hair loss area to the microneedling oh, yeah. and some of the the stem cell growth factors that they use. Yeah. And I was like, hmm, what's going on here? And I was like, oh, so it's like regrowing hair. And she was like, yeah, we've done like a small study and we added some, it was like a combination of growth factors that are involved in like, you know, stem cell production and the hair follicle. Hmm. And so I'm wondering if like you, but that's why I was like interested in the microneedling too with the hair. I was like, oh, so they're essentially just making it better absorbed. You're like, you're getting, whereas if you were to put some, you know, stem cell factors on just your scalp, like it's just not going to get absorbed, really. Yeah, I think the majority of the benefit is likely mediated via ensuring adequate absorption of the drug because when you do microneedling on its own, like versus minoxidil on its own versus microneedling plus minoxidil, like 
it's not a comparable outcome in terms of like, you would expect the microneedling alone group to be very significant if it was recruiting some sort of local growth factors that were dramatic. It seems more like it's probably in ensuring you're actually getting this to where it was supposed to go to begin with, but maybe wasn't getting fully assimilated, which is fine if that's what it does. It's just like, that's what some people need in order to get the absorption. But it could be like the difference of 4X the results I've seen in some studies. So. That seems like a legit pathway for for some men that are like a little bit skittish about potential side effects with the oral um, drugs as well, because like the finast finasteride and do what is the other one? Dutasteride. Dutasteride. Um, you know, I, you mentioned the the erection, but like, is there are there any other serious side effects with those uh, that are like really neurological concerned? potentially through the balance of like neurotransmitters, anxiolytic versus like there's a whole rabbit hole to go down of like inhibition of allopregnenolone, which is thought to be the main thing implicated in postpartum depression, being deprived of it, and there's a literal pharmaceutical that was developed to like manually restore that in women that just had birth and have postpartum depression and it seems to be efficacious. And seemingly by inhibiting 5-alpha re reductase, you may be inhibiting that like GABAergic signaling through that like angiolytic kind of like calming thing, uh, uh, molecule essentially. Mm -hmm. And it results in kind of like a, it depends on the person, like you can get pretty severe, I'm sure you've seen. Um, or at least, you know, depending on if you've seen the podcast where people talk about it or not. But no, I've heard of this like post dutaster or post finasteride see, syndrome. Interesting. You'll never have you you'll never hear about post dutasteride syndrome though. Yeah. Even why? though it's a way more potent drug. Because it's largely a media driven construction. It's not to say it's not real. There's definitely side effects from these drugs, but like there's a huge nocebo effect that comes with these drugs where you know, I have friends who get on it and they're like, dude, I swear, like, you know, my penis is not working like it used to. I'm like, dude, like, you're probably fine. Like, don't worry about it. And it's like they've read all the stuff that could happen and they're convinced they just like killed their ability to, you know, have sex or something. And it's like, you know, the nocebo effect is absolutely real and significant and I think is accounting for a large proportion of people who think they are affected because you can actually nocebo yourself into like, real side effects by believing you have them. Oh, for sure. It's yeah. very real. Yeah. yeah. And there's actually, believe it or not, there's genes that you can, there's SNPs that are known that you can look at. And even 23andMe um, does measure these SNPs for placebo versus nocebo. Oh, wow. And so like some people are more like susceptible to a placebo effect where they mm. like believe in something and oh, it's going to happen. And I'm like, like I'm taking all my creatine. And I'm like, yes, I'm like, I'm not getting sleepy in the afternoon and it could be placebo, but I don't care because it's a real effect. Right. No CBO effect is the same. And there, again, there's SNPs that like some people that have those SNPs are more susceptible to to believing that something is harming them okay. um, if they're like aware of those things. And so, yeah, well, that's interesting to, to know. But clarifying quick on the minoxidil, though, it's a growth stimulant. It does absolutely nothing that we know of to attenuate the miniaturization caused by DHT. So like the only strategy that works is attenuating androgenic activity via either like the mild ketoconazole, which probably is not going to be sufficient, but like over the counter, pretty benign, helpful, good shampoo regardless. That's why I use it. But finasteride or dutasteride or topical antiandrogen, probably going to be necessary for most people. Minoxidil is the thing you use to regrow hair. It's not the thing that prevents loss. You can cosmetically offset the visual perception of loss via the growing of hair but it does absolutely nothing to prevent the further miniaturization. So at some point, if you just use minoxidil, you will have a net catch up where you miniaturize to the point that you are caught up with what you've grown and then you blast past it and you still end up losing your hair. Okay. Oh, yeah. I so, see. So, But you can still delay the visual perception of it still if you're somebody who wants to avoid inhibiting hormones entirely. You know, that's a strategy. It's still like biding time. Transplants bide time, you know, it all makes a difference. Yeah. But essentially, if you want to completely bypass it, you have to get, you have to inhibit. Essentially, you have to like turn your scalp into a female. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, interesting stuff. And you're, you're... Mild exaggeration, but like, <laughs> you get it.